Okay, let's get started. Um, if you can't find your name on this list, there's a reason. This is from two years ago. I just thought I would put this up for a moment to give you a feel for, for what we're looking for. How does cutting help? Does cutting help? Definitely. How about centering? Somewhat. Less, right? Diminishing returns, but there you go. Okay, so uh, just sort of ballpark figures for what we got two years ago. We'll come back and talk about deliverable six uh, in a moment, but let's talk about where we are and where we're going. Um, last week, we finished our discussion on interactive systems design. We talked about de design philosophy, design uh, principles, design process, visual design. We're going to switch gears now uh, in theme number three and talk about us, humans. And as I mentioned before, we're pretty complicated creatures. We could spend a whole, whole course. We could spend a whole major talking about psychology. So this is going to be a crash course in a few bits and pieces of the human brain that are relevant when we talk about uh, HCI. Um, we're probably going to get through all of Lecture 10 today, so I apologize. I just put up the link this morning to Lecture 11. We'll probably start in on Lecture 11 uh, this morning. You'll also notice another difference uh, in the schedule here is that we're going to talk about Deliverable 6 on Thursday rather than today. And the reason why is, of course, because all of you, I'm sure, submitted uh, your data sets last night. So um, Jack, the TA, is going to now take all of those data sets, read them in, make sure everything's in the right format, and he's going to compile all of the data sets, compress them into one big archive that you will be able to download in Deliverable 6 when we talk about it starting uh, Thursday morning. So from now, uh, from now uh, Deliverable 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, the remaining five deliverables are going to be due Wednesday night at 11.59 p.m. rather than Monday night. So we'll talk about uh, the deliverable Thursday, uh, Thursday morning, and it will be due the following Wednesday. So you have no deliverables to work on until we talk about deliverable six on Thursday. Make sense? Give, Kevin a, uh, give Jack a little bit of a chance to put everything together and make sure we have uh, all the data sets. Sound good? What's the due date for the deliverable? Sorry? What's the due date for the due date for deliverable six is going to be next Wednesday at eleven fifty nine PM. The following Thursday we'll talk about deliverable seven. That will be due a week later, Wednesday, Wednesday night, and so on. All right? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about uh, cognitive psychology. I've broken this down into four lectures, and I've tried to organize them from the more objective aspects of human cognition to the more subjective. So uh, I've mentioned this many, many times now. The brain is a prediction machine, and what we actually mean by that, that's what's going to be the focus uh, of today's lecture. Then we're going to get into uh, memory, attention, and perception, some aspects of which are understood uh, given state-of-the-art in neuroscience and psychology. Then we'll get into sort of gestalt perception, frame of reference, sort of higher level abstractions in the brain which are not so well understood. And finally, we'll end in lecture 13 by talking about affect, which is a fancy word for emotion. So could we create in effective computing, which is sort of a subset of HCI, can we create machines that can recognize emotions uh, in humans, and if they recognize frustration and confusion, can they adapt the way that they project visualizations or the way that they project an interaction with the user to turn those emotions into more uh, pleasant ones? And we'll end in lecture 13 by asking whether we could get machines to exhibit emotions and would we want to do such a thing. Okay, when we finish lecture uh, 13, we'll move on to the next theme, which is sort of looking outward. So we'll finish our discussion about sort of standard interfaces and start to think about uh, the repercussions of stitching computation into the everyday world, right? We're surrounded by technology uh, and more so all the time. What does that mean? That greatly changes the way in which we interact with machines and vice versa. Okay. So, lecture 10, we're going to focus on mental models, and I promised you we're going to talk about people, but before we do, we're going to talk about machines. We're going to talk about a particular machine, 
Um, this is the starfish robot that I worked on a, a number of years ago when I was a postdoc at Cornell. And we're going to start with this robot because this robot differs from humans in pretty much every way you can imagine. Except for one, which is that it does have a brain. It's a very, very simple brain, and we're going to talk about its brain today. And it uses its brain in the same way that we use our brain as a prediction machine. So what you're going to see in a moment is how the starfish robot creates mental models. We know that humans create mental models. We do it all the time. We're not quite sure how we do it. The brain is a pretty complicated device. So robots are useful because we can often take an aspect of psychology, like the creation of mental models, and simplify it way down and give that functionality to robots and then observe whether that simplified aspect of cognition, which in this case is the creation and use of mental models, whether that functionality is useful for the robot. Okay, so I'm only going to talk a little bit about the robot today, I'm focusing in particular on this aspect of creating mental models. So I'm going to walk you through part of the, the experiment that we did with this robot. I'm going to show you how it creates mental models, and then how it uses those mental models or makes predictions using those mental models to get, to get around in its, its world. Okay, as I mentioned, this robot is pretty simple. As you can see from up here, it's made up of basically nine parts. There's the main body, and then each of the four legs is made up of an upper leg and a lower leg. I'll show you a video of this robot in a moment so you can see how it uh, moves. It has these nine parts. And we start out at the beginning of the experiment by telling the robot that it's made up of these nine parts, but it does not know how these nine parts are put together. So what this robot is going to try and do is create not a mental model of the world around it, it's going to focus on just creating a mental model of self. If we had more time, we would, we would look into developmental psychology, which is the branch of psychology that looks at development or how uh, organisms, in particular humans, progress from infants to adults. One of the biggest tasks for human infants is to distinguish between self and non-self. As the infant is starting to learn about the world around it, it starts to recognize that this thing is somehow different from all these other things. One of the most important things we do at the beginning of our lives is build up a mental model of self and be able to make predictions using that model of self about what we can and can't do. So I have a model of self and I know that if I reach out my arm, I'm not going to be able to reach the desk. I can make that prediction before I actually move my arm because I have a mental model of self. If I don't have a mental model of self, then I'm forced to try everything in reality to see whether it works or not. And that is a time-consuming thing to do. In many cases, it's a dangerous thing to do. I wonder what will happen if I walk towards, of this, walk towards the edge of this thing that looks like a cliff. Well, I'm not quite sure, so let's walk to the edge and see what happens. Uh, Karl Popper, a, a famous philosopher, said, one of the great things about cognition is that our hypotheses can die in our stead. Using mental models, we can make predictions about things we might want to try out in reality and mentally simulate them before we actually carry them out. And from a Darwinian point of view, you can imagine how that is extremely useful if you can do it, right? You can try out potentially dangerous actions using your model of self before you try it in, in reality. So mental models are useful for lots of things. We're going to focus here on the starfish robot on a particular kind of mental model, which is model of self. Okay, so we tell the starfish robot that it's made up of these nine parts. Um, each of these nine parts, or sorry, eight of these nine parts have motors attached to them, which are the little gray uh, rectangles that you see here. So it knows that it has eight motorized uh, parts. And what it's going to do in this cartoon here, it's created three different mental models. It's put these nine parts together in different ways. And the question mark is just a reminder that the robot is going to try and figure out which of these mental models is correct. So this is another aspect of human cognition, which is not only that the brain creates mental models, we often create multiple different mental models, and we often compete them against one another to see which ones hold up to our interactions with the real world. Which of these three mental models is correct? None, right? Okay. 
We'll see in the moment. See in a moment. We'll see in a moment how the starfish goes from these very poor models to to narrow in and refine them until eventually it has a correct model of self. In order to refine these models and come up with the right one, it's going to have to move itself using its eight motors. And when it moves itself, it's going to record two numbers, which is how much its main body tilts left and right, and how much its body tilts forward and back. If you remember all the way back to the beginning of the course, we talked about John Dewey, who said that action is primary, we push against the world, and sensation is secondary. We observe the sensory repercussions of our actions. So, what is the starfish, what is the starfish going to do? Well, it's going, the physical starfish is going to take in a set of motor commands. It's going to come up with some way of moving. It's going to actually move. And when it moves, it's going to produce sensory signals. So this is very much a Deweyan creature in the sense that it's not going to sense, think, and act. It's going to flip this around. It's going to move and get some sensory repercussions back and say, OK, when I did X, I observed Y. What does that tell me about myself? I want to try and build a mental model. Our starfish does not create life with a mental model. It has to build one up. So it creates, at the beginning, a mental model at random, like the one that you see here, which, again, is not a very good mental model. It's going to take that mental model, and it's going to mentally simulate it. It's going to mentally animate it. And it's going to animate it or simulate it by performing the same actions it performed in reality. Right? OK. When the mental model moves, this mental model is going to produce virtual sensor data. Sensor signals prime here. The prime is just going to remind us that this is sensor data generated by the mental model, not by the physical model. How is it going to use, how is the starfish going to use all of this information to determine whether this model is good or not? It's going to use machine learning, absolutely. We're not going to talk too much about the machine learning algorithm in a moment. But like KNN that we talked about a few weeks ago, the machine learning algorithm has to digest data. How is it going to digest this data? If the sensory signals are similar or the same, it's going to keep the model going. Absolutely. So it's going to compare the physical sensor data against the virtual sensor data. And the closer the match between these two things, the better the mental model is. So in this particular machine learning algorithm, which we're not going to talk about too much, it's going to follow a gradient. And by gradient, I just mean a slope. And that slope is decreasing differences between physical sensor data and virtual sensor data. At the beginning of its life, when it doesn't have a good mental model, it creates one at random. And as you can imagine, that random mental model, there's not going to be a very good match between the virtual sensor data and the physical sensor data. So it's going to change that model a little bit. And if that new model reduces the difference between sensor and sensor prime, it keeps that model because it's better and throws away the old one. If the new model actually is worse, there is a greater difference between sensor and sensor prime. It throws that one away, goes back to the original one, and follows the gradient or the hill down and down and down, where height means less and less difference between sensor and sensor prime. Make sense? So we know what the goal of the robot is, which is to create a mental model of self. It's got to build a mental model before it can use it. And the way in which it's going to build it is by acting in the real world, collecting data from the real world, and then simulating a bunch of these mental models following this gradient towards more and more accurate ones. So let's see how this works. Hopefully I can play this. OK. OK, so in stage one here, it's going to generate these internal models, or these mental models. And at the very beginning of this experiment, the robot does not have a good mental model. So it moves at random. There it goes. 
And now that it's moved at random, I'm going to show you a very uh, brief series of these mental models, one after the other. And as you can see, they're all pretty poor, right? They're not good reflections of self. Remember that during this process, this robot has no camera. It can't see itself. It has no other sensory information except left and right tilt and forward and back tilt. So the only thing it knows is that it's made up of nine parts and that the main body has these two sensors on board. That's it, right? So at the end of this short cycle that I just showed you here, at this, about this point, the robot says, this is me. How is that possible? Absolutely, right? So I, I apologize for my camera work, but if you go back and watch this video at your leisure, you'll see that the physical robot tilts a little bit to its right. And the green box at the end here is always tilting. Uh, sorry, no, in this case it was right. The, the physical, let me just back up. That's the easiest thing. Okay. If we watch the physical robot here, you'll see that the main body tilts a little bit backwards. Okay. And then by the end of this video, short sequence, the box is starting to rotate backwards into the screen. The sensor prime coming off here, the tilt information, is matching exactly the tilt information from the real robot. So the robot says, that's it, I'm good. I know how I'm put together. This is how I'm put together. What's wrong? Looks like the experiment has failed. The robot thinks it has the right model, but we know that it absolutely does not. It only has one data point. So if you were the robot, what would you do next? Go generate more data. How do you generate more data? As Dewey told us, right, you push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. So you know that you should do something, or you need to do something more. And actually, the robot does know that it needs to do something more, because remember that I told you that the uh, starfish robot always maintains multiple mental models. So in the short video here, I'm just showing you one, but it actually has multiple models. And there are many models that will match that small piece of data exactly. So the robot says, wait a second. I have this model, which matches all my physical experiences so far. And then I have a completely different model that actually matches all, that also matches all the information I have so far. But I can't be physically constructed in two different ways at the same time. So there's actually a signal from the robot that it knows it's not done. It says, wait a second, I can't be this and this other thing. I have two different mental models, both of which match my experiences. So I need to get more information. Right? This is supposed to be a lecture on cognitive psychology. So the robot is standing in for a human or a human infant or a user who's interacting with an interface for the first time. The human is also building up mental models of what's going on. And at certain points, that mental model is vague, or there are different mental models that match the experiences. So the robot or the human says, I need to, get, I need to go get more data. Yes? I just wanted to ask, does, so that keeps generating uh, mental models totally randomly? It starts random. It starts random. And as I mentioned, there's a machine learning algorithm underneath, which is searching for the best mental model it can. And we're not going to go into the details of it. But this machine learning algorithm is always looking. It's searching across the space of all possible mental models, all the different ways of attaching these nine parts together. And it's keeping the ones that reduce the difference between sensor and sensor prime and throwing away the ones that have greater difference between sensor and sensor prime. It's a search-based machine learning algorithm. Search for the one that has lower and lower Error. Yeah, so it starts with random mental models, but this one is no longer random. This is the best one, or one of the best ones that the machine learning algorithm can find so far. But is it testing it against continually random, like randomly generated ones, or each time the randomly generated mental model is better than the other? Uh, it, it starts with a set of random models, and then from those random runs, it produces variants, it makes slight changes. And if the slightly changed ones do better, it keeps those and throws away the random ones, and then makes variants of the variants, and variants of the variants of the variants. So very quickly, you don't have the original random mental models anymore. They've been long discarded by the machine learning algorithm. Good, good question. 
Okay, so an important aspect of building a mental model, as, as seems obvious hopefully to you by now, is interaction. Right? You often need to go get more information from the real world to uh, disambiguate between multiple competing mental models. So we know that the robot has to go get more information. So what new information should it go get? If you're the robot at this point, you know you have to go do something else, what should you do? Just keep moving, moving randomly in a, way. in a different way. You probably don't want to do what you just did before because then you don't get any new information. You get new data because you perform the same action a second time, but that data is redundant with the data you already have, which means you don't have any new information. It's the difference between information and data, right? So we want to be, or the robot wants to be, a little bit careful about what it does. It's probably going to go and try and do something not the same thing, probably not even something random. It's going to do something that's as different as possible from what it did before. OK. OK, so here it is in the first round. Here it's performing a second action. And you'll notice down here it says eight cycle of 16. So what the robot actually does is it alternates back and forth between pushing against the real world and observing how the real world pushes back grabbing that new piece of data, improving these mental models until at some point there's, it can't make any more progress. It explains all the data it has so far, going back to the physical robot, back to the virtual robots, physical, virtual, physical, virtual, back and forth, back and forth. So up till now, I've shown you one cycle. The physical robot did something, built some mental models. And I'm now skipping ahead to the eighth cycle. So the robot is now performing its eighth action. In this case, it tilts a little bit to the left, okay? So now the physical robot is armed with eight motor sensor pairs. It's done eight things in the real world, and it's got back eight sensory repercussions of those actions. And now each of the mental models has a much more difficult task. Each mental model has to be simulated eight times with the first set of motor commands, then the second set of motor commands, and so on, which generates eight sets of virtual sensor data. How do we know how good this mental model is now? If it can mimic all of the previous actions. Absolutely, right? It has to reduce the difference between eight pairs of sensor and sensor prime uh, signal sets, right? So it's trying to reduce that difference between all eight. At the beginning, when you only had one set, it was super easy, right? There were lots of different mental models that would explain what's going on so far. The robot has a lot of uncertainty about the models. Okay. At the, the reason I chose the eighth is if you watch carefully, it starts this eighth round of building this mental model or refining these mental models. It's, it's trying to improve them. It's going from something that's pretty poor until it has its eureka moment. At this moment, it suddenly realized that this mental model explains almost all of the eight sets. It's got the left leg correct, the right leg correct, the back leg correct, the front leg incorrect. Right? It's made a huge jump forward. And then a few cycles later, it hits on this variant and says, oh, wait a second. This thing is suddenly, the moment this thing was constructed, the difference between the eight sets the eight pairs of sensor data rapidly declined. How is this mental model? Not bad. Not perfect, but not bad, right? The legs are bent. OK. I'm now going to skip ahead to the 16th cycle. And in the 16th cycle, the robot, the 16th action that the robot performs is this. And these are all the mental models at this point. So the robot says, OK, I, I can't make any more progress. I found this one mental model, which even after 16, I'm getting pretty, a pretty good match. It's not perfect, but pretty close. OK, so now we're finished stage one, which is this robot has been able to build up an understanding of self. It's built a mental model. Stage two is, of course, why was it going to this going to these great lengths in the first place, it's because mental models are valuable. They're going to allow the robot 
to generate hypotheses about interactions with the real world before trying them out in reality. The robot, like us, now has the ability to generate hypotheses and have those hypotheses die in its stead. Okay. So what does the robot do in stage two? Well, in stage two, we now give the robot something we want it to do. We tell the physical robot that we want it to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. And when we tell the physical robot to do that, it does nothing. It, sit, it sits still and it thinks. It takes its mental model, this thing, and it tries out a new set of motor commands and it's measuring those motor commands for how well they obey the command we asked the, the physical robot to perform. So there is now a second machine learning algorithm. The first one was used to find a good mental model. The second machine learning algorithm is going to try out a whole bunch of different motor commands on this final mental model, and it's looking for one that will get the mental model from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Right? Um, let's say you close your eyes, and I'm sure you have a class after this, but you decide instead to go to the library. You can sit and think about what you know about the campus. From this room, what is the shortest path to the library? You can use a mental model of self and your mental model of the campus to plot out different routes to the library. The first route you think of may not be great. So that might have been the equivalent of the robot basically staying in place and not moving. You may say, okay, that path didn't make sense. I'm going to go left around that building rather than right around that building. And you say, aha, that path makes a lot more sense. It's going to get me to the library quicker. So when class ends, that's the path you use to get to the library. In the video here, I'm just sort of skipping ahead and showing you the final idea that the robot came up with, which is this one. And now that it has it in stage three, it's going to try it out in reality. So here's the robot following the shortest path to the library. We spent uh, three years working on this research project. It was funded by NASA as sort of a prototype for uh, their next generation of robot probes. We worked on this in the lab for three years, couldn't get it to work, couldn't get it to work. Finally, late one night in the lab, we finally got the robot to build a model of self and use it for something useful. So we didn't program the robot how to move. It came up with this on its own. Everyone working on the research project was crowded around the table. We were yelling and cheering. There was an undergraduate student in the lab working on a completely different project, sitting at another desk, was wondering why we were going crazy about three seconds of action from this robot. Turned around, looked at the robot and said, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> Thus, the name Starfish. I've left off the evil, but the evil Starfish. There you go. Okay, so the evil Starfish, I've shown you two of the things that it can do now, which is it can build a model of self, and then it can use that model of self to figure out what to do. So from our point of view, watching the physical Starfish, when we asked it to move from the left side of the table, it did nothing for a while, and then it started moving and did the right thing the first time. Why does that matter? Well, as I mentioned, this project was funded by NASA. Um, when NASA sends a robot probe anywhere in the solar system, they want to make sure that the robot does the right thing the first time. Right? Imagine the probe comes down on the rim of a crater, and the robot says, I wonder what would happen if I walked or rolled to the edge of the crater. Right? If it doesn't have a mental model, it has to try everything in reality, because it can't make a product prediction about the result of walking to the edge of the crater. So this robot is sort of conservative. If it finds itself in a dangerous situation, it can think about that situation before trying something in reality. Because its mental model is visual, it's something we can actually look at and understand, the robot might actually send that simulation back uh, to NASA and say, here's an animation, a simulation of what I want to try and attempt given what I know so far, should I, yes or no, right? So it might actually include other stakeholders in its actions, including, in this case, NASA's headquarters. It did what you wanted, but it didn't do it very like, efficiently. It absolutely did not. Uh, it did not move in the way that we thought it would. As you can see, it's got four legs. We expected that it would stand up and walk like a normal quadruped. 
Um, if you'd like to get an answer to why it did that, why it walked like this and not like a normal quadruped, come and take CS206 next semester and I'll tell you all about it. Okay, we could spend a lot of time talking about this robot. I'm using it today just as an example to illustrate what mental models are and why they're useful. Okay, so I've shown you uh, a couple of stages in this process and we're gonna look at the final stage in this experiment now which is what happens if something goes wrong to the robot? In this case, we uh, did a little bit of robot torture here. Uh, we sent in a graduate student with a screwdriver. He mechanically separated the lower leg. The motor in the lower leg is still attached to the robot. Remember that the robot does not have a camera. It can't see the fact that we've removed the leg. It has no pain sensors. It can't feel the fact that its leg is missing. Kind of feel bad for him, right? All the robot knows is that when it moves, in this case it moves, suddenly it got a different sensory result. So this is now nothing to do with the mental models. The robot says, wait a second, when I moved like this before, I tilted 30 degrees to the left, and now when I perform a little bit later, I perform the same action, now I only tilt 15 degrees to the left. That seems odd. How can I do the same thing twice and get two different sensory results? That means one of two things. Either my world has changed, I'm standing on a slope, or I have changed. Right? We're not gonna worry about the environmental simulation for a moment. We're gonna assume that we tell the robot, you've changed, but we're not gonna tell it how. So the robot goes back to the beginning and plays the same game again. It says, here's my mental model. Up, up to this point, this is how I'm made. But I know that there's a different piece of information now. There's some competing information. So it's trying to match the information. It actually briefly comes up with the right solution. And because of this machine learning algorithm, it actually loses it, unfortunately. Comes up with this idea, which is that its leg has shrunk. Interesting idea but doesn't make physical sense. So as it collects more data, this idea eventually goes out the window. When we published this work, we got a response article back from a dream psychologist that said this is the first dreaming robot. The optional reading, actually the required reading for today is about dream, the, this is a dreaming robot. Comes up with this kind of strange idea. It eventually throws this idea away and comes up with this idea How is this mental model? Those that are sitting at the front should be able to see that there's a glaring error in this mental model. Is the, the, the front part, and, or the distal and proximal parts of the legs in the top in the red uh, uh, Possibly, uh, that may be. That's, there, are a lot, there are several errors here. Purple leg isn't attached to its body. The purple leg isn't attached to its body. Actually, neither of the other ones. Oh. There are a lot of inaccuracies in these mental models, and this is another important aspect of a mental model. It doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. When you close your eyes and you imagine walking to the library, you probably couldn't tell me how many flagstones there are in the path between here and the library, right? You don't simulate the number of flagstones because <coughs> it's not important to the task at hand. In the same way that the robot doesn't matter doesn't bother trying to figure out exactly where the attachment point is between the leg and the main body, because it doesn't matter for this task. We're only filling in the parts of the mental model that matter for what we want to do. And we'll come back to that in a minute or two. You'll notice that it actually has figured out that it's now a three and a half legged robot rather than a four legged robot. But its idea is that its lower leg has shrunk to near microscopic size, which again doesn't make physical sense, but it turns out it's good enough for this task. It still thinks it has nine pieces too, right? It still thinks it has nine pieces, right? So it, exactly, it's kind of shrunk the pieces because that's the best explanation for what's going on, exactly. Okay, however, the task for this robot is still the same, which is to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. So the robot said, aha, I've changed. So the way in which the robot moves 
The way that the robot has to move also has to change. So the way it walked before worked for four legs, but does not work for three and a half legs. So that second machine learning algorithm that I mentioned, the one that is searching for a gate or a way of moving for the robot, throws away the four-legged gate and eventually discovers this three-and-a-half-legged gate. It says, okay, I'm a rover um, on Titan and one of my legs is broken off, but my mission from NASA is still the same. So I have to just carry on as best I can. And it comes up with this. And now it says, all right, I'm ready. My mental model tells me that I have a way of moving even though I've been damaged. You kind of want to put the starfish out of its misery at this point, right? Okay. How does it do in this case? It's still going, right? NASA takes billions of taxpayer dollars, builds some robot probes, takes 12 or 14 years to send it to Titan. It comes in a little bit too hot. One of the legs or wheels breaks off the rover. When it gets there, imagine NASA says, ah, oh, something's gone wrong, sorry. Mission over, right? Absolutely not. As long as the mission is salvageable, the, the rover, whatever the instrument is, should continue on as best it can. Here is one way in which a future robot uh, probe might do so by building models of self and refining those models of self if things change and using that sense of self, that inner model to make predictions about actions before carrying them out in reality. Okay. Okay, so we'll come back to the starfish in a moment. We've just touched on with this example different aspects of mental models that are important, which is we don't necessarily need a perfect model of reality. In fact, the word model means sort of an approximation or an abstraction of all the detail that's, that's out there. Right? So it also depends, again, not just on the A, the activity of the person carrying around the mental model, but the context and the particular person themselves. Right? So uh, again, an MP3 player. Right? What is an MP3 player? For someone who doesn't know a lot about, uh, about technology, if it plays a song, it's an MP3 player. Smartphones play songs, lots of other devices play songs, but there used to be back in the Stone Age these things called dedicated MP3 players, and if it plays a song, that's, that's, what, an, that's what an MP3 player uh, is. The more advanced user you are, the more refined your mental model might be. So um, let's say we have a discretionary user, someone who's pretty good at using a piece of tech, um, but doesn't care too much about the tech in itself, they're just interested in using it for whatever they're gonna use it for. So you go to the store and you buy your new smartphone and you start playing around with the menu hierarchy in your new phone. You've had smartphones before, so you might carry over your mental model from your phone uh, before, and you might notice that on the new phone, in the main menu, there are three main submenus: calls, messages, and options. You ask yourself, before navigating through the menu hierarchy, where's the send new message function stored, right? And your mental model will probably predict it's in the messages submenu, right? That would make pretty good sense. Most of us would probably agree, if you want to send a new message, you better click on messages. That's where it's going to be. Where is the turn off new message alarm? This one's a little bit trickier, depending on the phones that you've had in the past, you might predict it's either in messages or options, right? So like the starfish, you might have two, uh, you might have two mental models at the moment of your new phone. In the first model, everything to do with uh, alarms or turning on and off things belongs in the options submenu. Your other mental model might say that Anything to do with messages belongs in the messages submenu. Anything to do with phone calls belongs in the calls submenu, right? You might have different predictions or different mental models. So like the starfish, what do you do? You play with your new phone. You go and find where turn off new messages is. And let's say that you find it in options and not in messages. You might then ask, where is uh, turn off phone call sound, incoming call sound. 
You've refined your mental model. So now your mental model says, I don't have any uncertainty. I don't wonder whether it's in calls or options. I predict it's going to be in options. Right? You're refining your mental model as you interact with your new phone. You didn't start with a random mental model. You started with the mental model you brought over from your old phone. But you still might need to interact with the new tech to refine that mental model a little bit. Right? Early adopters tend to throw away their mental model and exhaustively go through every possible option and figure out everything and build up a mental model from, from scratch. So three different kinds of users that build different kinds of mental models and do so by interacting with their technology in different ways. Okay. So as we saw with the starfish, we need to do this by interacting with the system. So we act first, and our action becomes stimuli or input to the technology. The output or the response of the technology, we observe that response. So remember, back at the beginning of the course, we had our cartoon, where the output of the user, a physical action, it becomes input to the tech. The tech produces some output. It might be something drawn to the screen or a sound sent to the speakers, which becomes our sensory repercussion to our action. I did this with my phone, and my phone reacted in this way. If you're learning a new piece of tech, you might sort of just do rote learning. You might try and do a bunch of different things and observe how the system responds. So you get your Leap Motion device for the first time, you start up the Visualizer app, and you wave your hand over, and you see a skeleton hand appear. You flip your hand over, you wave it, you bring two hands in, you clap, you touch the device. You do a whole bunch of different things, and you watch the screen. You see the sensory information that's given back, and you record, you try and remember as best you can all the different ways that the system responds, right? The moment you see the second skeletal hand drawn in the visualizer, you know the system can recognize zero, one, or two hands, right? If there's no hands, it draws nothing. If there's one hand, it draws one hand. If there's two hands, it draws two hands, and so on, right? Okay. For a lot of users, they, that's about as far as they get. So uh, many years ago, I was trying somewhat unsuccessfully to teach my father how to use a word processor. He'd used a typewriter all his life. This brand new crazy magic device, a word processor. I created a whole bunch of post-it notes and put them all over his office, which said, if you want to delete a word, you press backspace the same number of times as the characters in the word. If you want to save, you click on this, and then you do this. We had I can't remember, about 100 post-it notes at the end. And when we had the post-it notes, he said, that's it. Don't teach me anything else. I know how to use a word processor. What's the, what's the drawback of that? If you're not kind of exhausted with your stimuli, then there could be some potential responses that you don't know about. Which there absolutely were. And I got frantic phone calls in the middle of the night that something had gone wrong with his word processor because he'd gone off script, right? So if all you do is rote learning, you have a mental model, but it's not a very powerful mental model. Your mental model says, you did this before, and I know what result you got. You did this before, and I know what response you got. But that's it. That's all I can tell you. I can only tell you what happens, what happened based on what you did before, right? So lots of information to, rec to remember. And I can't, the mental model says, I can't predict the result of a new action, right? So most of us, again, depending on whether you're interacting with objects in the world, if you're an infant learning about self, or you're learning about your new cell phone or elite motion device, you do a bunch of this, push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. And then you might start to recognize that there is structure in these interactions. So in this cartoon example here, there are basically two major kinds of responses you get from the system. For example, it shows you one skeletal hand or two. Right? So you might start to see some structure in those responses and do some conceptual compression so that now your mental model looks more like the right-hand side. You know that there is a class of interactions that result in this response from the system and this other set of interactions that result in these different kinds of results. You don't actually have 
uh, virtual representations of six boxes in your head, but if I was to ask you about the system, you might give me a verbal description that matches something like you see on the right. So in building up a mental model, for us, we can sort of think about this as these two different steps, collecting data and then compressing that data down into a representation. Not unlike what the starfish did, it acted a bunch of times against the real world and boiled all those experiences down into that virtual robot. Right? It found structure in the interactions. Does this now allow predictions about novel interactions? Pretty good, right? Assuming that there are three, uh, two result types, maybe the system actually has three different ways of responding to you. You just never found the third one. Right? So does a user's mental model match the mental model that the developers have? The developers say, yeah, we created this great new technology and it has these three basic modes of interaction. And the user says, what do you mean three? It's two, right? So one of the challenges in HCI is creating, designing an interactive system that given random interactions, if you assume that your user knows nothing, sorry, let me back out of this here. There we go, it's a little better. Given a, a little understanding about the system, if the user interacts with it, they're very quickly gonna stumble across the major structure of your, your system, right? We talked, when we were talking about design, about making your system visible. Well, we can make something visible by projecting as much data to the screen as possible, but that's not what we mean by visibility. What we mean is presenting responses to stimuli that allow the user to quickly build up an understanding of the underlying structure of the system. We could create a tutorial and try and teach the user this, but better that they build it up themselves. Okay. So, um, how we build up a mental model, we provide stimuli, we observe responses, and then we do this conceptual compression. We're gonna come up with hypotheses. So in this case, this might be one hypothesis. I might say, I think that there are two types of interactions, but like the starfish, you might have more than one mental model. You might come up with a second hypothesis that matches your information so far, and go back and get some more information, collect it, you might juggle different mental models until you converge on one that explains all your interactions so far. So we provide stimuli to the system, we observe the responses, and then finally we build a hypothesis. And to illustrate this idea of building hypotheses, we're gonna use uh, the Necker cube here. So in this series of lectures, we're gonna see a bunch of uh, optical illusions. Psychologists love optical illusions. Optical illusions are great because they often show some of the drawbacks of our mental faculties. The human brain is amazing, can do a lot of things, but can also be easily tricked under certain circumstances, which tells us a lot about what the brain is actually doing. When it makes mistakes, that's where you can best get at how it actually works. Okay, so we have a relatively simple system here. We have a cube. Which square is closer to you? The one bottom left or the one top right? Both. Both, right? Okay. Obviously, it's both, right? You're looking at a 2D picture. I want you now to try and forget that as best you can. I want you to try and relax and just look at the Necker cube and don't do anything. Just gaze at it for a few seconds. be somewhat hypnotic, the Necker cube. Okay. As you were gazing at the Necker cube, what happened? You know, of course, that there is, it is two-dimensional, but what did your brain tell you? What was your brain trying to tell you? That it's representing a 3D object, right? So your brain says there's some visual cues here that are telling me this is not a 2D object, it's a 3D object. What happens beyond that? Your brain starts to militate against the 2D interpretation. It says, no, 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 I'm building up a mental model that this is possibly a 3D object. It flips back and forth between the top square and the bottom square. 
Exactly. So most of you probably experienced the flipping of the Necker cube, where at one moment it looks like the bottom left panel is closer to you, and then it switches. Some of you have that experience? Most people have that experience. How quickly did the oscillation happen? Tenth of a second, every second, every ten seconds? Randomly? Okay. Did anybody see sort of a regular oscillation? I'd say it took like at least a second. I'd say it can't happen faster. This has been done on thousands and thousands of people for many years by now. Most people tend to eventually converge on oscillations at about a second or a little bit faster than a second. Why that happens, nobody knows. Why the oscillation happens, that's a little bit better understood. You are interacting with the Necker cube, which seems odd, right? It feels like you're just passively sitting there looking at something, that the stimulation is coming in, you're passively cogitating, and then producing a result, which is your prediction about which of these two is correct. But remember John Dewey, who said we act first and respond to the sensory repercussions. So when you look at the Necker cube, you're actually not looking at the Necker cube. Your visual field is actually very localized. You can only see in sharp detail a very small part of the center of your visual field. So you may, for example, saccade or move your eyes to this corner of the Necker cube. You start with an action. The muscles in your eye move your eyes. You see this corner here. You see this corner, and that matches up with some good information, which is this corner is forward, right? So maybe the interpretation that the bottom left cube, uh, square is closer to you starts to come to the forefront. That forefront, that mental model is winning. It's collecting some information. But your eye, your visual sense also sees some blurred uh, information out here. It can't see exactly. So your brain says, aha, if this, if this square is closer to you, I'm going to jump now. Your eyes are going to jump from here to this corner, which you can dimly see in the edge of your visual field. And your mental model says, when you land here, you should land about here. And when you land here, you don't catch the corner. The corner's a little bit off. So this is drawn orthogonally, right? This square is the same size as this square. If you were looking at an actual three-dimensional uh, cube, then this square would be a little bit bigger than this square, right? Remember, things that are further away tend to be smaller. So the moment your eyes jump, that mental model, which says the lower left square is closer, you get some new information which disproves that mental model. So your brain starts to discard that and says, aha, I was wrong. So let's move here. I move here, and now suddenly it kind of looks like this corner is jutting out. So now I'm getting some information for the competing mental model. OK, I got it wrong. It's this square that's closer. Your eyes see maybe this corner dimly in the edge of your visual field. You jump, and you miss. You don't end up where you thought. You made a prediction. You acted. And the result, the sensory, the sensory repercussion of that action does not corroborate the second mental model. So your brain throws that mental model away and says, maybe the lower left cube is closer, right? And back and forth and back and forth you go. So it looks like a three-dimensional cube, but it is slightly off. The back of the cube is not smaller than the front of the cube. So your brain cannot settle on one of the two mental models. You're juggling these two mental models forever, right? The Necker cube is a great example of how we build mental models by act pushing against the world, saccading or moving your eyes, and observing the sensory repercussion of that action, and the fact that you usually don't have one mental model. You're juggling multiple mental models, and through your interaction, you're trying to collect data that will prove or disprove these different hypotheses or mental models. So far, so good? Okay. All right. So let's put the technology back in the Skinner box. Remember the Skinner box at the beginning of the semester where we provide some stimuli, we provide some response. So how exactly do we play this game? Well, in psychology, there are a lot of theories about how we actually play this game of building and refining mental models. And they're often written down as a bunch of boxes and arrows, um, which becomes a cognitive architecture. And a cognitive architecture is kind of a 
a loaded term because it can suggest that we know what's going on in the brain. There are seven different things your brain does in order to play this build a mental model game. Keep in mind that a cognitive architecture is really just a guess by a bunch of psychologists about how you actually do this. This seven stage process is probably not literally encoded in your brain. It might look like someone who's interacting with a new cell phone is doing these seven things. It's just a hypothesis, but it helps us think about this process in a little more detail and isolate some of the challenges of actually doing this. It sounds easy, right? You try something out, you see the sensory repercussion, you decide what to do next, but it turns out that in this process, there are two different gulfs that, you, that your brain needs to get over. The first one is the gulf of evaluation. So you have your new uh, cell phone, you do something to the phone, you get a response back, you see the response, you interpret your perceptions, and then you say, well, wait a second, does that new piece, of, the new piece of information help me, or am I just more confused than I was before? How do we know, given this new piece of information, this new interaction with the cell phone, whether we've moved closer to our goal our goal might be to build a mental model. It may be to use the technology to do something. I don't care how it works. I just wanted to do something. I did something with it. Did it work? Am I getting closer to my goal? It's the first thing we need to figure out. Once we get over that gulf, we start to, for example, build our mental model. And we say, wait a sec, we don't have enough information yet. I don't really understand what's going on. I need to do something else with the phone. I need to interact with it in a new way. What new way? What is the new action you should perform to get some more information out of the phone? So let's come back to the starfish here and think about the two gulfs that the starfish comes up against. So the same thing. The starfish says, I did something. The physical robot moved and I got some sensory data back. Did that help me or not? How does it know? Well, the starfish gets over the gulf of evaluation by saying, I now no longer have seven pairs of sensor data. I have eight pairs of sensor data. I did something. I got this eighth piece back. And if that eighth piece allows me to find a new mental model that reduces error, the difference between sensor and sensor prime on all eight, if it got lower than even it was before when I only had seven pieces, then it was a good thing. I performed an eighth action, and that eighth action had new information, and that new information helped me, the starfish, to find a better mental model, something that explains all eight pieces, even better than I could explain all seven. If it can't do that, then the action probably wasn't helpful. If it performs the same action twice, Nothing happens, right? It, it, it's sort of spinning its wheels. It can't make any improvement in mental models. It failed to cross the gulf of evaluation. It didn't do the right thing. If it says, hey, the difference between sensor and sensor prime is decreasing, I crossed the gulf. Whatever I just did was the right thing. OK, so now it's done eight things and it starts to think about doing a ninth thing. What is the ninth thing it should do? It's got to cross the gulf of execution. It's got to decide what to execute or what to do next. We ended our discussion in the first phase with the starfish by saying it should probably do something different, right? Don't do the same thing. Don't even do something randomly. Do something different. But what does different actually mean? It's a tricky thing to do. What the starfish actually does is it says, well, wait a second, I don't have one mental model. I have multiple mental models. And let's say in this cartoon example here that our starfish has these two different mental models. And it says, well, wait a second, these two mental models are both accurate, but they're both different. So I have to keep going. I have to do a ninth action. So it dreams up a new action but doesn't perform it in reality yet. It takes that new action, supplies it to mental model one, and supplies the same action to mental model two, and gets two different sensory repercussions from that one action. Model one rotates to the left, or tilts to the left. Remember, the starfish has tilt uh, data. The second model predicts or tilts to the right. So 
I put the word prediction in here. Remember, we talked about the brain as a prediction machine. When the mental model takes in an action and produces sensory repercussions, that's a prediction. The model says, hey, physical, physical self, if you perform that action, this is what's going to happen. But model two says, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. So the two models are disagreeing in their prediction. Model one predicts that for this action, the physical robot will tilt to the left. This mental model predicts for that action, the robot will tilt to the right. Is this a good action for the physical robot to perform? Yes, right? So they can't both be right, right? One of these mental models has to be wrong, or maybe they're both wrong. Maybe the robot's going to tilt forward. So we know now that if the ro physical robot carries out this action, it's going to get a ninth piece of information that's going to invalidate one or possibly both of these mental models. So what the starfish is actually doing, it starts at the beginning by performing a random action, but the second through the 16th action are not random, and it doesn't necessarily choose the most different thing to do. It chooses the thing about which it's most uncertain. This is now an interesting topic in developmental psychology. Up until we published this paper, the thinking was that if you watch a human infant and they're playing with uh, toys and they're putting objects in their mouth, um, they're doing all sorts of things. It looks kind of random, that they're just randomly exploring what their body can do. But maybe infants are not doing things randomly. Maybe they are doing things actually very systematically. They are performing actions that weed out uncertainty in the predictions of their growing models of, of self. Again, we don't know, but at least for the starfish, this is the best way to proceed. So when the robot interacts with its world, it's interacting non-randomly. And an intelligent, uh, an intelligent user of technology might start by doing random actions, but then consciously or subconsciously, they will start to perform non-random interactions, interactions that are meant to reduce uncertainty in their model of the technology. So, uh, so back here, for example, they might very carefully choose uh, ambiguous messages in which there are two mental models, one that says turn off X is in the options menu, and another mental model that says turn off X is in the messages uh, directory. They can't both be right unless that function is in both subdirectories, uh, sub, sub menus. So they're choosing actions consciously that reduce uncertainty. Aha, things that say turn on or turn off tend to be in options, not within the, the, the X thing, calls or messages. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so um, it turns out that building mental models and then using them for predictions is not really a straightforward thing. There's a lot going on under the hood, and we need to keep that in mind when we're designing technology for people. Of course, there's lots of other aspects about interactions uh, with the technology that have uh, little to do with mental models. They're also hier uh, they're not hierarchical and serial. They're going on in parallel. So in the starfish case, things are pretty simple. It would do one action, trying to learn a specific thing, then a second action, and so on. Humans are much more sophisticated. We are often, uh, we're often making predictions and judging whether they were uh, upheld or disproved at different time scales in lots of different ways. We may have intentions. I want the cell phone to do this. I've got a particular goal. I'm trying to figure this out about the phone. I'm thinking about different ways to interact with the phone. I've got different ideas about what may result. I have beliefs that I bring over from other technology. I'm frustrated. I don't have a lot of time. I'm only going to do two or three things, and I'm going to throw this phone in the garbage. Uh, or I'm on a bus, so I got lots of time to kill, I'm going to just play with my phone and see what I can get it to do. I am attending to the phone while I'm attending to other things. Obviously, when we're dealing with humans, there's a lot of things going on, and they're all leading to parallel inputs to the device and parallel responses. Let's focus on just time scale. What are some interactions where we expect responses to come back at sub-second time scales? Absolutely. So when you wear VR goggles and you hold your head steady and your eyes move, 
long as the image stays the same, everything holds up, right? Because you're just like the Necker cube, you're just moving your eyes and you're saccading to a different still image because the goggles recognize that you haven't moved your head. So that's good. Let's stick with the example of the headset. What are some other sub-second responses that you might expect if you're wearing a VR headset? Uh, head movement. Head movement. So I move my head, but I don't saccade my eyes. Whatever I'm looking at on the inside surface of the goggles, whatever aspect of the screen I'm looking at, I move my head, but I keep looking at it. What should happen? The things that you see should move. The things you see should move. I might keep my eye on this part of the screen, but the object should flow in opposition to the movement of my head. And if that response happens any less than a few milliseconds, if there's more than a little bit of a, a lag, people feel nauseous or dizzy or take off the goggles, we're done, right? You have 20 or 30 or 40 years experience that when you move, the world immediately moves in the opposite direction. What are some cause and effect processes you engage in with technology where you don't have that expectation? Uh, you turn a system on, right? It's, it's going to have to do something to, to start up, right? We're all kind of used to that. The amount of time we might wait has decreased over the years, but we don't expect real-time interaction. Okay. When you start to develop your educational system for, uh, uh, for teaching ASL digits, there are certain aspects of your visualization that better respond in more or less real-time to the user, and you probably know what those are. Waving the physical hand and seeing the virtual hand move more or less uh, at the same time, and other interactions which the user is willing to wait a little while for, right? And knowing which ones the users expect or which cause and effect processes the user expects to happen at the millisecond level, the second level, seconds to years, uh, it's important to, to know what those are. So some other ones are moving a mouse. If you move your mouse and the cursor has a bit of a lag, again, that can be extremely frustrating. We've come to expect that interaction to be real time. Uh, entering data, starting up a computer, sending an email to someone. We know there's now a person involved and people don't necessarily respond in real time as much as we would like them to do so. We're willing to wait a little while, right? So we have all these other expectations when we interact with the device that have, that don't necessarily have to do with the mental model itself. Okay. So, um, humans build mental models, but the human brain has some limitations. Um, it's difficult for us to run simulations internally. You can close your eyes and chart a shortest path to the library, but if I picked a random building downtown and asked you to give me a detailed set of directions about the shortest path to get there, it's difficult to do, right? The mental models that we maintain are abstractions, right? They're not, they're not perfect. Mental models degrade over time. We forget things, right? If I were to email you five years from now and ask you the shortest path between building A and building B on UVM's campus, you might not remember the campus so well and be able to give me a good, a good answer. Our models are, bi are affected by bias and superstition, right? This is the way things worked on my own phone. I want them to work this way on my new, new phone just faster, right? Uh, that may or may not be true, but it biases the way I build up the mental model, and again, we adopt them from, uh, from previous systems. Okay, so how, do, how can we as HCI designers help people build up a mental model? We can, make, we can make this process harder or easier on our users. What are the design principles? What are the rules of thumb that we might apply to make this an easier process? We might try and provide a system image. So a system image is mostly the user interface, but also other aspects of the system as a whole. Is there an, is there, is there an overall style to the system? Your style might be to hide most of the internals of the system from the user. If you ask anybody how Google works, they'll say, well, there's something where you type something in, and when I type it in, it goes and gives me back a list. For most people, that's their mental model of Google. 
And for most people, that's good enough. They don't need to understand the details of page rank and all the rest of it. It's good enough, right? So Google realized that everybody on the planet is going to want to search. So their demographic is everyone. And the majority of everyone is not going to care what's going on under the hood, right? But it depends, right? How much information do you advertise about the internal structure of your, your system? That's part of the style or the overall system behavior. And then that informs how you might actually create the user interface or the documentation or the help system or the tutorials, what have you. You might rely on our good old friend, uh, the visual metaphor to help communicate information. So if you have a whole bunch of buttons, the physical proximity of buttons may tell you something about the underlying structure. So button one and button two are physically close to one another. They generally help with a particular kind of response. Button three and button four are close to one another. They are collectively responsible for response number two. And one and two and three and four are distant from one another. They have to do with different parts of the system. So distance now between pairs of buttons it is a metaphor for semantic distance. So semantic distance is things that are further away provide more different kinds of functionality than things that are close. Common functionality should be visible, should be easy to see on the screen, very accessible. Maybe things that are done very rarely or dangerous actions should intentionally be hidden away or made small or hard to access or written in red and covered in are you sure notifications and, and so on. What are some other visual metaphors that might help communicate the underlying structure of your system? So you're going, in a few weeks, you're going to be creating an educational system. And in that educational system, you will probably walk your, walk your user through a series of levels. Level 1 and level 2 are relatively easy. Level 4, 5, 6 are harder. How might you communicate that to your user? You could write a whole bunch of text saying there are a whole bunch of levels here. And the first ones are going to be relatively easy. But we're going to keep you from doing the later levels, which are harder and take longer, until you've accomplished levels 1, 2, and 3, and so on. Instead of saying all that, how might you visually show something that advertises that? I myself have noticed that if I hold my hand for like a duration of time, it starts to get tired. So for me personally, I want to create like a visual metaphor for like maybe balloons holding up the hand. So like <laughs> subconsciously, I'm like that, like freaking out to hold my hand. That could be, right? So maybe the balloons are an advertisement saying there's some structure to the system. We're helping. We're helping your hand, right? You may not hold it perfectly steady, right? But we're going to we're going to doctor the image of your hand a little bit as as we go, right? It might be an advertisement that there is a part of the system which otherwise might not be uh, obvious, which is that we're centering the hand, right? Maybe balloons or things that are pushing from different directions could communicate that part of the the system. It's a good example, right? You're probably not going to write on the screen, um, we're capturing all the data from your hand in a NumPy array, and then we're centering the data using x, y, and z. But you could put something that says, the, the position of your hand in our system is not exactly the position in the real world. If you move your hand a little bit, that's OK. We, we're, we're providing a little bit of support. Other examples? Absolutely. So we could have a progress bar, how far through the system you're getting. There might be barriers placed across the bar which say that suggest there's some structure to the system. You cannot go to the next level until this bar is removed, which will cause your user to update their mental model. I get it. There's barriers in the system. I can't just arbitrarily skip to a future lesson. I have to progress. So their mental model will then make a prediction which is, how do I go about removing the bar? What do I need to do to get to the next level? Right? They're playing this interactive game with the system. You've communicated some information, some structure. There are barriers, which becomes part of their mental model. And then they start to think about, use their mental model to predict. Well, I played video games before where there were barriers from one level to the next. And in all those video games, I had to complete 
level i before I could get to level i plus one. So what does it mean to complete a level in this new game that I've never seen before? Okay, I think we'll leave things there. You have a quiz due tonight, and we'll talk about deliverable six on Thursday. Thanks very much. <laughs>